Shalom, 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 shalom. Baruch Hashem Elohim, Baruch Hashem Abayah, Baruch Hashem Adonai Yah Hamashiach, or otherwise known as praise the name or bless the name of Jesus. Welcome to Fellowship of the First Resurrection Church. This is a morning Bible study for what Babylon calls Thursday. Um, normally we have our we have a midweek Bible study on Tuesday evenings, um, regularly scheduled. That's a regularly scheduled Bible study. Uh, but sometimes if time permits or if the spirit moves, um, we will have Bible study sometimes on Thursday morning for a midweek morning Bible study. So that's what we're doing just to keep people um, throughout the week in between the Sabbath, you know, on track with the Lord. So this has been a good week for that because after the Sabbath, we have Purim. So we have Purim lessons on Sunday and Monday, then on what Babylon calls those days. And then we had um, a midweek evening Bible study on Tuesday, and now we're having morning Bible study. So really this week, you only had um, one day this week between the Sabbath where the church wasn't doing a lesson, right? And so this is part, the lesson we're going to be, the Bible study lesson we're doing this morning is who is the real Christian part two? Because if you remember our midweek Bible study, and let me um, change this part because I know I didn't take the, tonight, our midweek Bible, today's lesson. Yeah. Um, so on Tuesday evening, we did the lesson, my family and friends think I am in a cult who is the real Christian. And so we got about halfway through the notes on that lesson. And I said, um, Lord willing, we would do the other half in a morning Bible study if time permitted. So time has permitted. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Amen. All right. And the title of this lesson is who is the real Christian part two, or if you want a longer, more complete title, my family and friends think I'm in a cult. Who is the real Christian, right? So we're going to open up with prayer. We're going to sing a hymn. And after that, we're going to pick up where we left off um, on Tuesday evening. Amen. All right. And um, sisters, we ask that you cover your heads. Brothers, we ask that you uncover your heads. Again, sisters, we ask that you cover your heads. That's the women. Brothers, we ask that you uncover your heads. And we'd like to send a special shalom out to our international audience. If anybody's watching in Africa, Asia, or Europe, because normally when we do our lessons, the time the time of our lessons for people living in like Asia and Africa and Europe be wonky because uh, we're over here on this side of the Atlantic. So if you're watching us in Europe or Africa and it is the afternoon, shalom to you. If you're watching us in Asia and it's the evening or nighttime, shalom to you. All right, let's turn and face Jerusalem as the Bible says we should when we pray, if at all possible. Let's turn and face Jerusalem and open up with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come together in the middle of the week to have a morning Bible study and to grow closer to you as members of the body of Christ. We pray, Father God, that this word that goes forth, that it will fall on fertile ground, where it will be watered and nurtured and leave the fruits of repentance and works of righteousness so that we can make the kingdom and make the first resurrection. We pray, Father God, that we do not add to your word and that we do not take away from your word, but that we teach your word line upon line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And we ask that you would add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to sing a hymn. Bible also says you should sing hymns and praises to the Lord. So we'll see how this goes. I'm singing it solo without the wifey. And I know it's the middle of the day, so your kids are probably at school. But if you are homeschooling your kids and they're at home, you can bring them in for this uh, hymn we're about to sing. Because I'm going to sing, we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns from when I was a little kid. It's a children's hymn. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's called Father Abraham. All right. One, two, three. 
Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right on, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up, turn around. All right. Hallelujah. I did a turn around in my chair, but all praises to the most high. All right. Now we're going to pick up where we left off um, on Tuesday. Give me just a second. And the Bible commands you to praise the Lord and to sing hymns. So that's why we do that. It doesn't matter if you can sing or not. That's not relevant. It's about praising the Lord. So everybody can participate and sing uh, together. Doesn't matter if you know how to sing or not. I don't sing. I rap. And y'all know, y'all heard from my raps. Like, I may not, I'm not a professional. I may not have the cadence. I may not have the kick, dog, the cadence and all that. I'm professional. But you do not want to see me in the cipher with the lyrics, right? Anyways, facts. <laughs> Facts. These are all facts. And I'm being the songs you've heard, I'm being nice because we're Chris, we're Christian. But you don't want to see your boy in the cipher with the bars. But I can't uh singing, that's not my thing. But we still gotta praise the Lord. So that's why even when I do raps, a lot of my raps be incorporate biblical things to give praise onto the Lord. All right, a couple things really quick before we get started. Um, Passover is coming up in like a month. Um, there's still people who celebrate Passover wrong. So you have people celebrating Passover this week and earlier this week because they don't do, they don't add the leap month, the 13th month every two to three years. And, um, so some people, theirs is just floating all throughout the year. So it's not in the season. Then you got other people who I don't know what they're doing with their calendar, but somehow, I don't think they even have a calendar. I think they just put everything always in March. But anyways, one of the ways, this is something for people to keep in mind. If you live in the United States, especially like the Southern half of the United States. Okay. If you live in Florida, which is the, I, for, I should know this. Hold on. I'm going to be real technical. Hold on one second. I want to get the right one. Can't tell. Hold on. I'm trying to see what we're explaining. Did this one explain it? All right, I'm it's taking too long for me to find out to to figure out which one it is with the longitude and latitude. So that's irrelevant. Just know this, if you, so if you live like in Florida and you draw a line from Florida straight across on the map, you know where you're going to end up? You're going to end up in West Africa. You're going to end up in like, yeah, you're going to end up in Western Africa. If you draw a line from uh, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, all that, or straight across, you're probably going to end up in like Morocco, Tun Tunisia, same. So point is, this is all the same. We live in the Northern Hemisphere. 
So we have the same growing cycle. It doesn't matter that Jerusalem's in the Northern Hemisphere. We have the same agricultural cycle. As long as you don't live somewhere too far, so far up north, where it's frozen most of the time and they just don't grow stuff, we all have the same agricultural cycle. Okay, so keep that in mind. You should not be celebrating Passover, having Passover in the middle of a frost or a freeze. Facts. So even like here, in t this is why we do the, this is why the Bible says to keep the Passover, keep Abib, right? And keep the feast in their seasons. They have to be kept in their agricultural seasons. And those agricultural seasons correlate to the astronomical seasons. Okay. And to make, and so that's one. So if you're celebrating Passover and unless you live like in Canada or the far up North, if you live in a normal place where it's not frozen all the time, then you shouldn't be celebrating Passover in the, if you live in the Northern hemisphere in the middle of a freeze, especially if you live somewhere like we're going to use America as an example. If you live in the Southern United States, it shouldn't be in the middle of a freeze when you're doing our frost warning when you're doing Passover. Passover is supposed to be in the springtime around spring after the last freeze or la last freeze because the freeze would destroy the crops and this is supposed to be at the time of greening, okay? This is another thing too. You don't have to be, and we just cover this so that there's no confusion with people because there's a lot of weird stuff that you'll hear on the internet. You don't have to, uh, someone doesn't have to be in Israel to observe barley to determine when Abib is or to determine when we add the 13th month, right? That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. It said that the children of Israel came out in the month of Abib, right? Now, a couple of things with that. One, barley is not some unique crop that is different than all other crops. It's a regular crop. So barley is not the only crop that greens during this time. You don't have to overcomplicate this. I want this for like for my church. You don't have to overcomplicate these things. The stuff, it works just like how the seasons work. So you know how now it's starting to, I'll speak for where I live in the Southern United States. If you live somewhere where you have actual, where you have actual seasons, things are beginning to green now. We just had our last frost this morning like last frost and freeze warning this morning and um, yesterday. But stuff has already started to begin to green and a little bit of, um, you know, budding up, right? But it hasn't got, it hasn't gotten fully there yet. And we just had a freeze, so that's probably going to stop that. But the point is, is at the, at the time when you start seeing things coming back to life again, greening, greening back up, right? the bees and all that stuff coming back around. That's when you know for people who live in climates where you have the, you know, the four seasons, that's how you know, oh, Passover, a bib is coming up. Amen. All right. Another thing with the barley, whether you realize it or not, because again, we are, I'm a pastor where I peel back all the layers of the onion to get to the core root of the matter. Why are you looking at, why do you think you need to look at barley in the promised land when the children of Israel, when they left, when they had the first Passover, they weren't even in Israel. They were in Africa. So the barley they would have been looking at, you know, during Passover, the one you, would be in Egypt, would be in Africa. So technically, if you're saying, oh, I need to look at the barley, right? If you're trying to do that, then you would need to look at the Egyptian barley, not the, not the barley in Israel. And the only reason why you're looking at you think you need to do that is because of traditions, not biblical things, but because of traditions that have been that have been passed down by men. Right. Men's traditions. So technically, if you were going to be looking at the barley, it would be the barley in Egypt. If you had to do that, not the barley in Israel. Another thing in Numbers chapter nine the children of Israel are in the wilderness in the Arabian Peninsula, Numbers chapter nine. And they keep the Passover. This is their, this is the second year now they've left out of Egypt in Numbers chapter nine. The children of Israel kept the Passover in the wilderness, okay? 
So if they're keeping the Passover in the wilderness, they're nomads. Remember, they're traveling. They're not growing crops. They're not sedentary. And it's the Arabian desert. There's not much that grows there in the first place while they're wandering around during this time. This is why the Lord had to feed them with quail and manna. We didn't read anywhere. You don't read anywhere in Numbers chapter nine where it says they had to observe barley. And think about it. What barley would they be observing? In Numbers chapter nine, they're in the middle of the desert wandering around and they're not growing crops at this point because they're wanderers, they're nomads. Keep this in mind. And they still celebrated the Passover, right? So you don't, you don't have to see, you don't have to observe a barley in Israel greening to know when Abib is, especially if you just keep track of the moon phases, which you should if you're a real Christian anyway. If you keep track of the moon phases yourself. Amen? Amen? All right. One, last, one other thing before we jump into today's lesson, but this is just an example of for parents, you know, don't. Don't spare the rod because a lot of you new age parents don't want to discipline your kids. You want to be friends and buddies with them. And that's not biblical. That's not biblical. When they become an adult, you can be friends and buddies with them. When, but you still, even when they're an adult and you can be friends and buddies with them, you're still the parent. And so you still call to a higher accountability and you are still required to, uh, you are still required to impart wisdom into them. If they're doing something that you know is not right, you still required to tell them that, right? But once y'all become adults, then you can be friends and buddies, right? While they're still children, you need to you need to correct them when they do things wrong, and you need to discipline them when they do things wrong, and not spare and not spare the rod. So to give you an example, though, to show you how far off humans are when it comes to this. And, you know, I'm always telling you how animals have better sense a lot of times than humans because animals will actually the other animals, the majority of them do what God created them to do. Humans are the only thing God created that where the majority of the people don't do what God created them to do. So my cat, she um, has a son, but the son doesn't you know, really stay with us. He just be outside. And, you know, he come in sometime, but he mostly be outside and he's somebody else's cat anyway. And but when he come, but the few times he does come in the house, my his mom, like when she gets irritated with him, she bops him like she like a straight like a parent. Like she literally smacks him on the head when he's doing when he getting out of when he getting out of line. So if my cat has enough sense to do that with their own child and the cat and the cat that she's doing it with is an adult cat. And my mom will still bop me up the head, bop me upside the head to this day. And I'm 39. If she see me doing something stupid or saying something acting stupid, my mom will bop me upside the head because she knows I know better. Right now. Um, and I've used that example before about how I've seen cats fight. I've seen a female cat fight to the death to protect her kittens from being taken from her. And I have seen humans who have left their babies in the toilet. Humans who've left their babies in the garbage. I saw this Puerto Rican chick. I think it was in Michigan. Uh, it was either Michigan or Ohio. It might have been. Ohio. I think it was Ohio. Because they got a lot of Puerto Ricans in Cleveland. I think it was somewhere in suburban Cleveland. But anyway, this Puerto Rican chick in Ohio, she went on vacation to Puerto Rico to see her lovers, you know, to have to fornicate. And she left her one-year-old toddler at home by herself for 10 days. The one-year-old died from starving to death, eating its own feces. The, it, it, it resulted into eating its own feces because it didn't have nothing to eat. And she literally starved the baby to death for 10 days so she could go fornicate in Puerto Rico. And when she went, she got sentenced to life in prison, rightfully so. They should have killed her. Facts. Oh, uh, biblically. According to the Bible, if Jesus was here, she would have got killed. Do you hear what I said? If Jesus was here and we were doing, and Jesus was in charge, she would get the death penalty and she wouldn't be on death row. This is all in your Bible too. That's not my opinion. I don't make this stuff up. Literally in your Bible. She would not, she would not be on death row for like a whole, like 10, 20 years. 
she's supposed to be executed immediately. That's according to the Bible. But when she went before the judge, the judge, um, the judge reprimand, reprimanded her and, and was like, I've seen animals take more care for their, <laughs> I've seen a dog take more care for her puppies than what you just did for this, uh, for what you did for your toddler. So, and if for our international audience, like the stuff I be telling you should scare you and spook you. Don't come here. <laughs> All right? When I'm saying don't come here, don't come here. Don't move here. This country is wicked. And unless something changes, it's going to get destroyed anyway. So you're away. if you plan on living longer than 30 to 50 years, don't come here. Because America, as you think of it, will not exist 50 years from now unless America does some changes. And another thing, we have a lot of crime too. So I wouldn't even come visit here as a tourist. You might get robbed. You might get shot. Real talk. All right. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 11. But before we do, Nehemiah 8 and 8. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to read in God's book. We're going to deal with a few subjects. We're going to read in it distinctly. And we're going to make sense of what we're reading. And we're going to cause you to understand what we're reading. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 11, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. So again, the question is, who is the real Christian? On Tuesday, on Tuesday night, we ended uh, dealing with the Sabbath, showing you how in the Bible, according to the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you're a real Christian, then you will keep the Sabbath. Amen? Now we're going to show you in the Old Testament and in the New Testament if you're a real Christian, you will keep the dietary dietary law. So real Christians don't eat pork. Real Christians don't eat shrimp. Real Christians don't eat um, crab. See, this is where, watch this one. So a Sunday Christian, a, a false, this is a false Christian. Because remember the full title, the full title of this lesson was my family and friends think I'm in a cult. So who is the real Christian, right? So your family and friends who think they can eat pork, think they can eat crab, right? And think they can eat shrimp and all that stuff, even though the Bible says you can't eat that. Those same people will tell you gambling is sin and is and is wrong. Well, remember, and I'm not saying this because I gamble, because I don't really gamble. I don't. I've gambled, I gambled one time, and that was because my sis, that was because my sister made me, and she had a gambling problem. And so I was up. She gave me I didn't want to do it. I told the story before she gave me twenty dollars and I got up to forty dollars and I was ready to cash out because I'm a smart man. I'm smart. I'm not a dummy. You know, I you gave me twenty dollars. I was free. And now I'm up another twenty. Let me stop. Right. But my sister, she the sister I'm talking about, she addicted to gambling. She was like, no, you got to go to the, you either bottom out or a jackpot. <laughs> like, and she made me keep playing till I ended up losing the whole $20. So I don't, uh, and I'm not knocking gambling. I'm just saying it's not my thing. I don't know that much about it. it there are some people in the, in the church who do it. And if you ever want to take me with you and show me some of the stuff, I'm all for it. Your pastor's cool beans. Like, cool, like I'm cool to kick it. You want to show me? That's fine. But um, since I grew up in a home that had this wrong ideology that gambling is a sin when it's not, I didn't learn anything about it because my mom thought gambling was a sin. All right. Even though technically it's not. Um, so that's one thing. But one thing I have said, if you anyone who understands the lottery next time y'all around me, if you can show me how that works, I would do that because I believe the Lord, since I'm a righteous person, the Lord might bless me with the lottery at some point. But I don't even know how it works. The only betting I've ever like done on my own was with the homies like over sports, not seriously, or on Madden when I used to play video games like that. You know, like Madden, NBA Live, NBA 2K, FIFA. You know, you understand what I'm saying? We put money on that, like uh, whoever wins. But other than that, I don't don't gamble. So the same people who will tell you that it's okay for you to eat pork and eat shrimp, most of them will tell you gambling's a sin, even though nowhere in the Bible does it tell you gambling's a sin. And I, and I won't get it. We're not going to do a lesson on gambling. But the Bible says sin is transgression of the law. 
So if it's not a transgression of the law, then it's not sin. The Bible tells you eating pork is a transgression of the law. So that's sin. You gambling in and of itself is not sin. Now, if you become addicted to gambling and you take it to the extreme, then that will be a sin because we're supposed to do everything in moderation and we're not supposed to be mastered by anything. Right. Remember, Jesus is our master. So if you're addicted to gambling, that means you have another master. And the Lord said you can't serve two masters. OK, but if you have to, if you know, if you are a recreational gambler, that's fine. And when gambling becomes a sin, just another another example of when gambling becomes a sin is if you see your if you start losing money, like, oh, I'm starting to lose money. I, now I'm in the negative. All right. Then you should stop because now you're in the negative. You're not you're losing you're squandering what the Lord has blessed you with. The money the Lord blessed you with, now you're squandering it. So, so you should stop. If you're hitting and you're winning, you're a righteous person, the Lord helping you out, you're getting blessed. It's literally all that simple. And I brought up the gambling connection because you'll have, these people will go stay in Las Vegas and eat shrimp and crab, but won't gamble. <laughs> I know people like this. They will go to Las Vegas, but will not gamble. As crazy as that sounds. My parents have been to Vegas. They don't gamble. All right. And they'll eat the crab and the shrimp and all that and enjoy the buffet, but then think gambling is, is wrong, right? Which is not the case. All right. Now, let's pick it back up here. Leviticus chapter 11. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. So the Lord gives you specific instructions on what animals or what meat you can and cannot eat. So the Bible is clear. You cannot eat whatever you want. Okay. And we could go over the reasons why the Lord has this dietary law. And we went over that last week when we did the dietary law lesson. This is just going to be a brief touching on the dietary law. We just did the lesson on the dietary law. Right. So if you want to know why it's a good idea, go watch that lesson. Like why the Lord would even do this, go watch that lesson. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter why the Lord would do this. He's omnipotent. So if he tells you to do something, you just do it. You know how your parents, sometimes you would ask them, why I got to do this? Because I said so. It's the same thing with the Elohim. Because they said so. So the, El the Elohim has given you things you can and cannot eat. Okay, so you have to abide by that. It doesn't matter why. When I'm saying it doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter if you think it's silly. Like, why does, G why does Jesus care if I eat pork or not? Well, why does Jesus care if you're a man and you sleep with another man? Jesus cares about all aspects of your life, your sex life, your diet, everything, right? That's why with your sex life, the Bible says you are only to have sex with your wife or husband. Any sex outside of a husband and wife is fornication or adultery. And that would be transgression of the law and a sin. Amen? And even between a husband and wife, some, some things are not allowed between them as well sexually. Like the husband or the wife, because we live in a sick world now, neither one can sodomize each other. That's a sin even with the husband and wife, okay? A man can't go in onto his wife when she's on her menstrual cycle. He can't have sex with her, which should be common sense. That's nasty, right? But I'm bringing this up that that's in the Bible too. Jesus wants control of all aspects of your life, including what you eat, all right? Let's run it back. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying unto them, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, these are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Skip down now to verse 44. We're not going to read all of the animals. We just did that for the dietary law. If you want to know, you can read this whole chapter on your own time. If you didn't catch the lesson we just did on the dietary law. Or you can go back and watch the lesson from last week on the dietary law from last Sabbath. All right, now, skip down to verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. Now, Keep in mind, while we're dealing with this, the dietary law right now, we're going to switch to another subject after we finish with the dietary law. But keep these words in your mind right now, sanctified and holy. 
Notice he relates the dietary law and keeping it to being sanctified and holy. So keep that in mind when we go into the New Testament. All right. And some of the passages we're going to read so that you are so that you realize that even in the New Testament, you have to keep the dietary law. Okay, because we're going to read scriptures that will confirm that. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. That means set up, set yourselves apart. Right. That, that means to be set apart. So you're going to be different. Right. So you're supposed to be different in everything. I don't celebrate the same holidays you celebrate. I don't eat the same. I don't eat the same foods you eat. I don't live my life the same way you live. I don't do things. There should be people should notice a difference in your life across the board. Not just in a couple things, but across the board. All right, verse 44. For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Notice here, he said, you are to be holy, just like God is holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves by eating anything unclean. So keeping the dietary law isn't the only thing that makes you holy, but it's one component. Keeping all the commandments makes you holy, right? So the dietary law is one of them. If you don't keep the dietary law, it just told you here, you will be defiled. You will be unclean, right? And, and, not, and unholy. A holy person will keep the dietary law. All right, let's pick it back up here at verse 45. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law, right? Remember, 1 John 3 and 4 says sin is transgression of the law. And that's the New Testament. 1 John 3 and 4, the Bible tells you sin is transgression of the law the law. So how do I know when I'm sinning? Did you transgress God's law? How do I know what God's law is? Read your Bible and read where he tells you. So we just read here, this is the law of what you can and cannot eat. So if you violate this, what does that mean? You have now sinned. This isn't an Old Testament thing. This is a Bible thing. This is a Jesus thing. In the New Testament, they tell you sin is transgression of the law. The New Testament tells you sin is transgression of the law. First John 3 and 4, sin is transgression of the law. All right, verse 46 here. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl, that's birds, and of every living creature that moveth in the water, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. So if you violate this law, you sin. Also notice here, Yahweh are the Lord. Remember, there's two Yahwehs, okay? The Father is, is a Yahweh. Yahweh just means eternal one, self-existing one, okay? And Christ is a Yahweh. The Yahweh talking to Moses here is Christ and to the children of Israel is pre-incarnate Christ. The Bible tells you that. But where are they, where are they pre-incarnate Christ get this dietary law from to give to the people? The father. Remember, Jesus gives us whatever the father tells him to give us. Jesus tells you that in the gospels. All right, now, so remember how I said, keep in mind, you know, when we go into the New Testament, in the New Testament about holy and sanctified. Also keep in mind here in verse 47, it said to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. Because in the New Testament, it talks about how people who are unclean and who touch the unclean thing, that those people, this is in the New Testament, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So if you don't keep the dietary law, you're unclean, right? And unclean people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Verse 47, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Let's go to Acts chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Acts chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. So we're going here now to the New Testament. We're going to read this in Acts chapter 10. 
in Acts chapter 11, for some odd reason, and we dealt with on um, Tuesday night, we what Babylon calls Tuesday night. We used, uh, we did a similar example with the Sabbath in the book of Acts. We were, we went to, I forget what chapter that was in Acts, but um, we were like, you know, we don't know why some people who think they're Christians go to this chapter in Acts and think it says you don't have to keep the Sabbath because we read it. Nowhere does it say that. Nor did it say, nor did it say you were going to um, that Sunday replace the Sabbath or now you're commanded to go to church on Sunday. Nowhere did we read that. So the same thing here, a lot of people who think they're Christians, they will come to Acts chapter 10 and think Acts chapter 10 proves they can eat whatever they want. But nowhere in this passage do we read that. And in the next chapter, it clarifies exactly what it means. And this is why I, I mention this all the time. You can't cherry pick scriptures. You know, like, oh, I just cherry picked this one verse. You have to read the Bible in its context, which means you have to read whole chapters. You have to read whole books. Another thing that's really bad that people do that I don't understand, you shouldn't read your Bible randomly. What do I mean by that? It's a book. You need to read it from beginning to end. So start from the beginning and start reading it till you get to the end. Don't just pick a random place and this is where I'm going to read for today. No, you need to start from the beginning and read it till the all the way to the end. If you want to read random precepts, let that be in conjunction with your daily Bible reading where you started at the beginning of a book and you're reading to the end of the book. Okay? Okay. That way you don't get confused. Remember the Bible, the Bible, the Bible is different from other books in the sense that it has the keys to salvation. But outside of that, it's a, it's a book or many books. So you need to read it the same way you would read any other book. Okay. You're not going to pick up the great Gatsby and turn to the middle of the great Gatsby and start reading from there. And you don't know nothing about the great Gatsby. You're not going to pick up of mice of men and then start reading the last 20 pages and think, I understand what Steinbeck was trying to say. How? You never read the whole book. Okay. So remember how when you were in high school in English class, they made you read things, at least here in America, like Brave New World. Their eyes are watching God, 1984. Um, trying to think the giver. I think that's more like middle school. Whatever. When you were in school, did your teacher have you read? Did your teacher have you start at the end of the book? No, you have to read the whole book in order to understand it. It's the same thing with the Bible. So let's go to Acts chapter 10 and we're going to pick it up at verse one. And what's funny is they use this to try to say Christians can eat whatever they want. <laughs> but this actually shows you that the Christians in the New Testament and the early church the early New Testament church, they kept the dietary law. They didn't eat pork, shrimp, catfish, rabbit, possum. Uh, all those things are unclean. You know what I'm talking about? Verse, Acts chapter 10 and verse one, there was a certain man in Caesarea, in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So this man, Cornelius, is a Gentile. He's an Italian. He's a non-Israelite. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So even though he's an Italian, a Gentile, he believes in the religion of the Jews. Verse three, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And remember this angel of God is the Holy Spirit. It tells you that later in the chapter. That's just a side note. Verse four, all right, because the Holy Spirit is not God. The Holy Spirit is an angel. The Bible tells you that like 10 times. Nowhere in the Bible does it call the Holy Spirit God. And nowhere in the Bible does it tell you there's three gods. And nowhere in the Bible does is the word Trinity even mentioned. Facts. All right, I digress. Verse, and if you're wondering, well, how come people believe in the Trinity? How long is it going to take you people to realize that the majority of muggles like lies. They like being lied to. 
The majority of people like being lied to. Okay? So this shouldn't be like a weird thing. Like how come most people who are Christians think there is a trinity? Because most people like to believe in lies. They like to be lied to. Trust me, I know this personally because one of my nicknames is the imploder because I implode relationships. Not because I try to or want to, just because I'm a truthful person and I tell it how it is. And most people don't like that. They don't like to deal with that. For example, you know, we lost someone in the church because I told them you talking real, you talking real greasy about one of your own friends and who's also a member of the church and you talking about them bad and you shouldn't do that. And then I also told this person, you need to spend more time with your wife and kids. Spend more time with your family, right? As the, as a, the pastor, what happened to that person? They, they left the church. They didn't want to hear that. The majority of people, when I do counseling and I have to tell them the truth about themselves or their situation, they end up leaving because people don't want to hear the truth. They'd rather be lied to. That's why they heap up for themselves. And we read this on Tuesday. Teachers, right, who will feed their itching ears. Itching ears means things I want to hear. Okay. Not what I need to hear, but what I want to hear. Right. Let's pick it back up here at verse four. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Notice here the angel of the Lord, which is, which is the Holy Spirit, how come the angel of the Lord didn't just explain to Cornelius himself what Cornelius needed to do for salvation? Why? Line upon line, upon line, precept upon precept. Jesus told you salvation is of the Jews. So if you want salvation, you need to find the Jews. Facts. Let's pick it back up here. That's why the Holy Spirit didn't just reveal to him everything he needed to do, everything he needed for salvation. He a Gentile. If he wants salvation, he's going to have to come to the Jews. Same thing with the heathen. All If you're not, even other Semitic peoples, if you don't descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by blood, and you want salvation, you're going to have to come to the Jews. And you're going to have to get on the Jews program. This is in your Bible, whether you like it or not. And it's in the New Testament. And, we're, and I'm giving you the example right, we're looking at an example right here. But anyways, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at, ver, at verse nine. And so being more technical with that, what that means is even if you're taught, if you're taught by somebody who's not a Jew, that's fine. So long as the person who's teaching you learn salvation from a Jew or whoever taught him learn from a Jew. Or whoever taught that person learned from a Jew. So you could have a group of Gentiles teaching the truth, and they could have, they could be teaching the truth for hundreds of years, and have had, and they don't have any direct contact with a Jew now. But who, the person who got them on the right track when it comes to the scriptures hundreds of years ago, was somebody who had contact with a Jew, and that person taught them correctly. All right, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse nine. And, it's, and that's because the Bible tells you that God chose the Jews for that specific purpose. The Israelites were chosen to bring salvation to the rest of humanity. Verse nine, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh onto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So Cornelius had a vision and the vision told him he need to go find Peter. Now the Lord is giving Peter a vision and this vision is in relation to Cornelius, right? Cornelius coming to see him. But the, the Lord is going to use food and animals as a metaphor, as an allegory, okay? 
Verse 10, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending onto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So what does Paul mean here when he says, I haven't eaten anything unclean? We just read in Leviticus chapter 11, it, where it tells you what is clean and what is unclean. And you are only to eat the things that are clean. Now ask yourself this, as a New Testament Christian, right? People who use that term. If you're a New Testament Christian, what makes you think you can eat pork and eat whatever you want when Peter here in Acts chapter 10, who's the head of the church, mind you, Peter is the head of the Christian church at this time. He's the head. The head, the head of the Christian church is telling you here, he keeps the dietary law. I don't eat anything unclean. Now watch this. If Jesus declared everything clean and, and if Jesus said you can eat whatever you want in the gospel, then how come, and if he told his disciples that, then how come here one of his disciples and the one that he put in charge is telling you, I don't eat pork, I don't eat shrimp, I don't eat catfish. If Jesus told him he could eat whatever he wanted to eat, then Peter here in this dream wouldn't have been saying, no, Lord, I don't eat anything unclean. If Jesus had told him in the gospels, he could eat whatever he wanted to eat. Because if you have a funny style Bible, meaning a non a non KJV, like the NIV and stuff, there's a passage in them funny style Bibles. That's why they add stuff. That's why Trump was pushing the KJV for y'all. But anyways, I digress. They add, they add stuff in there. And the NIV and these other funny style Bibles, there's a passage in the Gospels. We read the passage in uh, the lesson we did on the dietary law. They add the clause. They literally add this. And thus, Jesus declared all foods clean. That's not in the Textus Receptus. The Textus Receptus is the Konania Greek original writings of the New Testament. The Konania Greek, excuse me, New Testament. In that passage, nowhere in the Textus Receptus does it say Jesus declared all foods clean. Because he didn't. If Jesus had declared all foods clean, then Peter here would not be resisting the Lord as far as eating things. And the reason why Peter is resisting, he's being circumspect. Remember, the Bible says you are to test the spirits. So Peter is being extra circumspect here. Even in the dream with the Lord talking to him, he like, nah, that goes against the commandments. And I'm not supposed to go against the commandments, right? So he knows this has to be something else, okay? Okay. Let's pick it back up here. And we're going to read where Peter, because after this vision, Peter thought of, thought on this because he was like, nah, something's not right. I know Jesus isn't telling me I can eat pork because that would be a sin. All right? Let's pick it back up here at verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice and the vessel was received up again. Now, when it says here, what God has cleansed, that call not that call not thou common. This vision, this dream, the Lord or Jesus didn't cleanse the animals, meaning now you can eat whatever you want. We're going to read in the Bible. Let the Bible interpret itself. Let the Bible tell you itself what it means. Let God tell you through his word and the Bible what he means. So we're going to read here when the Lord said here, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This is talking about the Gentiles and the heathen, the non-Israelites. Amen. And the reason why, he, the, reason why the Lord had to tell Peter this is because one, they had a custom and this custom is not in the Bible. It comes from the Talmud. So, you know, the Talmud is a satanic, is a satanic book. That's why it's not in the Bible. 
and the fake Jews use the Talmud. Real Jews keep Torah. Fake Jews keep Talmud. Real Jews keep Torah. Fake Jews keep Talmud. Real Jews keep Torah. Fake Jews keep Talmud. So in the Talmud, it tells them not to eat with uh, non-Jews and stuff. And that's not in the that's not in the Bible. So Peter Hat was keeping that um, tradition or custom that's not in the Bible, right? And he wouldn't eat with he wouldn't even eat with a Gentile. Also, Paul and uh, not uh, Paul Peter, Peter and all of the disciples, like not just Peter, all the disciples and all the Christians at this point are all Jews. They haven't started converting Gentiles. Even the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch was a Jew. That's why he was coming to Jerusalem to worship. Okay, That was an Israelite, an Ethiopian Jew, an East African Jew. Okay, They don't start converting Gentiles till Cornelius here and then in Acts chapter 13. The reason why they didn't deal with the Gentiles up until this point is because Jesus told them not to deal with the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, the 12 and the 70, don't go in onto the Samaritans and don't go in onto the Gentiles. Only preach the gospel to the 12 tribes of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what Jesus instructed them to do at first. So this is why they hadn't been converting any Gentiles yet. Okay. But now the Lord is telling Peter, the head of the church, it's okay now because you guys have been spreading the gospel amongst the Jews. Because remember, whether you like it or not, everything goes through the Jew first. The Jew first, then the Gentile. That's the reward, that's salvation, and the punishment. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So don't look at us real Jews and be like, oh, I wish, God, you know. No, it's not, eat. We, to whom much is given, much is required. And we're, his, we're the Lord's firstborn. The firstborn always has more put on them. Facts. I'm the last born. I'm the youngest, the baby. I was spoiled. Anyways, I digress. Facts. I was spoiled. All right, compared to my other siblings, facts. My parents spoiled me. I was the last, the baby, right? So Israel is the firstborn of the Lord, okay? So when it comes to the punishment, God punishing people, the Jews going to get it first. When it comes to the reward, the Jews get it first. The other nations, they get the same stuff too, but the Jews get it first. Because remember, we're the firstborn. Okay? Just like when, when the Bible tells you you give an inheritance, the firstborn gets a double portion. Okay? But at the same time, <laughs> the firstborn will get that double portion punishment. Amen? All right, now... So this is why the Lord is telling Peter now using this dream or vision. And remember, the Bible tells you this. And we read this, um, I think, during Purim. The verses in the Bible in the book of Job about dreams and dreaming. The Lord speaks in dreams and in visions. The Bible tells you that. And it tells you in Job, he specifically speaks to you in dreams to change your mind about something. Okay. Okay. So the Lord was speaking to Peter here to do what? To change his mind about something. So we have to find out, was the Lord trying to change his mind about what he eats? We're going to see, no, that's not what the Lord was changing his mind about. The Lord was wanting him to change his mind, so he sent them this dream or vision in regards to converting the Gentiles. The reason why he's doing this here in Acts chapter 10 is because if you read the previous chapter, Acts chapter 9, who gets converted? Saul. You know, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, the apostle Paul. So Paul gets converted in the previous chapter, and the Lord is going to use Paul primarily to reach out to the Gentiles. So he's preparing Paul for that. So now in the next chapter, that's why the Lord is telling Peter now, the head of the church, it's okay for you to convert Gentiles because I'm going to send this dude Paul to you and this is the one who I've set up to be the main one, not the only one, but the main one to go on to the Gentiles. Okay, let's pick it back up here at Acts chapter 10. And we're going to pick it up at verse 16. And just keep this common sense 
thing in your mind too. The Elohim doesn't change. You know, why would you worship a, a God that's schizophrenic or bipolar who can't make up his mind and a God who lies to you? He tells you one thing. He tells you one thing 3,000 years ago. Then he tells you something else a thousand years ago. And then that's not our God. He doesn't change. Our God is the same today, yesterday, forever. He changes if not. Amen. Do we have to read those scriptures to get that in your head? All right. Let's pick it back up here at verse 16. This was done three times and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. See, I told, told you, Peter, when it says he doubted that, doubted the vision, Peter doubted because doubted the vision because he knew in his mind, Jesus isn't telling me I can eat whatever I want. That's a, that would be a sin. That would be transgression of the law for me to eat something unclean. So Peter here is like, what did Jesus really want me to get from this? And the reason why he's like this as well, too, is because if you're a righteous person and you've ever got dreams and visions from the Lord, you know how this works. You know, whatever the dream was, the Lord was really trying to tell you something else or get another point to you, you know, and the dream was just a parable or a metaphor or an allegory. OK, now let's pick it back up here at first verse. Uh, um, 18 and I mean, verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he has seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius have made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men speak thee, seek thee. Notice here, the spirit is talking to Peter now, capital S. So this is the Holy Spirit. This, the spirit, if you read this whole chapter, it lets you know numerous times that the spirit or the Holy Spirit is the same angel that went and told Cornelius to find Peter in the first place. Verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. What we read earlier in the chapter is that the angel of God sent them. Now it's saying the spirit sent them because they're the same person. That's a lesson for another day. All right, let's pick it back up here. When I say a lesson for another day, we can read that to you out of the Bible. The Holy Spirit is an angel. I can read that to you in the Bible like 10 times. Facts. I cannot read anywhere in the Bible where the Trinity is mentioned. I cannot read anywhere in the Bible where it specifically says the Holy Spirit is God. You won't read that. So according to the Bible, that's make-believe. That's a figment of your imagination. All right. I'm a high IQ individual, so I'm going to stick with the Bible. I don't like humans and I don't like muggles and I don't trust humans because humans aren't perfect. They're flawed. God is perfect and his book is perfect. So I'm going to trust what I can read in here. Okay. If I can't read it in here, then I don't trust that. I don't care if you if you got a PhD from Fuller Seminary. I don't care. I don't care if you're a molecular, you know, by whatever scientist, rocket scientist. I don't care. I don't care what your profession is. Okay. You could be a NASCAR driver. I'm just using random examples. I don't care. I'm not listening to you over the Bible. Not going to happen. I'm not listening to my parents over the Bible. Not going to happen. Don't care. Okay. So for example, my parents think it's okay to eat whatever you want. And even when, that's why I don't be around them a lot anyway. And plus I live in a completely different state now, but the last time we was around them and was going to eat my dad. And this is my dad. Did this. this is why I go hard in the pain on my dad. My mom, I give passes on. She's a woman. And I understand like she did the best she, she did the best she can do. So I don't have any, I don't, have no issues with my mom. All right. She did the best she can do. And at the end of the day, giving her, and I, and I know with my mom, cause a lot of y'all know, cause I share um, personal stuff as a pastor to edify people. I don't hold a lot of stuff against my mom because her dad died when she was like 11. And she's even said that part of the reason of 
having been married so many times, she even said if her dad was alive, she wouldn't have done that. Right. So at the time where she started becoming a woman and a teenager, she didn't have her dad in her life because he passed away when she was young. And my mom, regardless of if it regardless of if it turned out bad after the fact, my mom's intentions for me are never bad. Like even when it even when she's even when it uh, appears to be mean, my mom's and I know my mom is my mother. Her intentions are not like bad. My dad, though, mm -mm, not nah. like hit. My dad has my dad will do evil, wicked things intentionally. So the last time we were the last time we were um, over there. Right. And this was uh, this was I haven't been to their house in like over four years. So this was like five years. This was like five years ago. Right. So five years. This is like and keep in mind for some of you people who are afraid to leave mommy and daddy. Cause I'm talking about adults. You're like in your 20s and you're in your 30s and all that. And I'm not saying I have a different circumstance. You might have a loving relationship with your parents. So I'm not saying go to my extreme. What I am saying, though, is you got to live your own life and build your own life, bro. You you don't you shouldn't be in your 30s and 40s. Still just living at home with mama and daddy, unless you're a girl, unless you're a daughter and unmarried. You really should not be making that your permanent decision just to do that. Another thing, too, you're just, another thing, too, even if that's not the case, sometimes just I'm just pointing out because some of you guys could not fathom that ever. You haven't been back. You haven't been to your parents' house in over four years and like five years. Yeah, no, nah, I haven't. I'm living my I'm getting my stuff in order and they don't believe in keeping all the laws, judgments, statutes and commandments. They're opposed to my religion and what cohabitation can light have with darkness. Amen. And yes, I'm supposed to honor my mother and father. If they ask me to do something, I'm going to do it as long as it's not a sin. Because I'm going to honor my mother and father. But at the same time, I'm one of nine and I'm the last one. I'm the last on the totem pole for responsibility. There's eight people ahead of me that, that are, should be more response that they should go to for things before it even comes down to me. Okay. But I'm bringing this up because some of you could not even ever fathom being separate, being that far away from your parents or anything like that. And you're an adult. You need to go and live your own. You need to go and live your life, man. All right. Anyways, I, di I digress. And some of you, like, some of you, I'm going to say this. You were so, the time to move when I remember the Lord, I said this a few years ago. The Lord was saying, if he's told you to move, it's time to go. If he told you to stay put, then stay put. And some of you, and there were some of you who didn't act and you missed that window of opportunity, okay? But for the this one, what I'm about to say here, this is from the Lord. If this applies to you, your window of opportunity is not gone yet. You still have a window of opportunity to move, okay? Some of you have too much responsibility placed on you individually and placed on you and your husband are you and your wife and your household to take care of the rest of your family. You know, you're an adult and your parents are adults. Your parents aren't handicapped. They're not retired. They're not retired. They're working age. OK. And you feel like I need to be responsible for them. You feel like I need to be responsible for my niece or nephew. You feel like I need to be in. Mordecai took in his cousin, so that's a good thing to that's a good thing to do if your family needs to do that, if that comes up. But at the same time, if this is stressing you out, right? If it's stressing you out and it's too much responsibility, it's too much on you, move. And that's not even and that's not your responsibility anyway. Whose responsibility is it primarily, you know, for your niece or nephew, your aunt or uncle? Whose responsibility is it for your working age parents? Them, their working age parents and working age adults. That's who they're, that's, they're responsible for themselves, okay? Some of you, like I'm speaking from experience. One of the greatest things I heard came from Sister Jennifer because Sister Jennifer said this, Sister Jennifer said this 
that her dad said, and it's facts. You don't feel what you don't see. Let that sink in. You don't feel what you don't see. So what I'm describing to you, this is a side note, side lesson. I experienced that. I dealt with that. I don't deal with that anymore because I'm long gone. When I'm saying long gone, I got like six, seven states between me and that nonsense. But as long as you keep letting your family, your, when I'm not talking about your wife and kids, I'm talking about your extended family, you know, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, your working age, the adult parents, as long as you keep allowing them to, you know, to pull on you and all that, you're going to continue to keep dealing with the same issues. If you don't want to deal with them issues anymore, move. And in the Bible, most righteous people, the Lord told them to move, send them on a journey because he wanted to have complete control over them. And he wanted to send them. He had somewhere he wanted them to go. Amen. Like he called Abraham out of the land of his nativity and had him journey all throughout the Middle East and Africa. Right. So some of you, you need to leave your comfort zone. You're never going to you're never going to achieve all that the Elohim has for you by staying in your comfortable place. OK, me and Amber, that's my wife. We know all about leaving your comfort zone with great risk comes great reward with no risk comes really no reward. But I digress. Let's pick it up here at Acts chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 21. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent on to him. And every I know the people I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say them. But I know who you are. And you have siblings. You adult people, you have siblings. Let them handle it. You've been handling it enough. Let your siblings get in on some of this. Do you understand? Maybe it'll sink in. Maybe it'll sink in for one of you. There's about three of you. You dig? All right, I digress. I digress. There's about three of you. It's two dudes and it's a girl. But anyways, I, di I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse. Let's pick it back up here at verse 21. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent on to him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? All right, I have here in the notes, if Jesus declared all food clean according to your non-KJV Bible, then how come Peter here as a Christian and head of the church is still keeping the dietary law? So who is the real Christian? The real Christian is somebody who won't eat pork, who won't eat shrimp. Let's go to Matthew 16, and we're going to come back to Acts 11. So keep your finger here in Acts. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Just so we know who we're dealing with here with Peter. So when Peter told, told him I, in the New Testament, this is, I, and Peter now, he's a Christian and he, he's head of the church. And Peter said as head of the church, I will not eat anything unclean, right? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. I just want you to know who it is, who it is here in Acts chapter 10, who's saying, I don't eat anything unclean. All right, verse 18. And I, I mean, verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar meaning, that's Aramaic for son, like Ben. So he was Simon Bar-Jonah. Jesus gave him the name Peter. All right, let's pick it back up here. Middle of verse, uh, middle of verse 17. All right. For flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he just sat here with Peter. He was going to use to build his church. Right. And Peter was the head of the Christian church. Right. Which was headquartered in Jerusalem. And then later, when Jesus's brothers got converted, James joined Peter and Peter and James were the head of the Christian church. So what on earth makes you think as a Christian, even in the New Testament, that you could eat whatever you want? When the head of the Christian church in the New Testament clearly just told you he don't eat anything unclean. 
All right, let's pick it back up here at verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, now let's go back to Acts chapter 11. And the Bible is going to tell you itself what it meant with that vision Peter had. It had nothing to do with food. All right, let's pick it up here, Acts chapter 11. And then this is why we're not reading the passage in the Gospels about washing your hands before you eat. Because if Jesus said there, which nowhere does it say that, all Jesus said was whatever food you eat, you're going to poop it out. But anyways, if Jesus had declared all foods clean, then Peter wouldn't have been, Peter in Acts chapter 10 wouldn't have been resisting eating unclean food. Peter would have been like, okay, uh, this vision is saying eat. Oh, I'll eat. I can eat whatever I want. Because remember, before Peter fell asleep and went into the trance, Peter was hungry. So if Jesus had told him he could eat whatever he wanted, then in the dream, Peter would have been like, okay, right? But Peter had no concept or understanding of that because Jesus never said that. The passage that we're referring to in the Gospels was about washing your hands before you eat. And Jesus said that that's a tradition from the Talmud. That's not in the, that's not in the scriptures. So yes, you can eat without washing your hands. Is that wise to do? No. But is it a sin? No. Okay. That's what Paul, that's what Jesus was dealing with there. And when Jesus said, you're going to poop it out, remember the context. If you eat something and your hands are not washed and maybe you put, and now you eat the food and you had bacteria or germs on your hands and now it's gotten onto the food and you consume the food with that bacteria, what's going to happen to you? This isn't rocket science, adults. What happens to you when you eat bad food? You get something called stomach flu. You get norovirus. And what happens when you have stomach flu? You get diarrhea and poop all that stuff out. And where does it go? Into the drought. Just like Jesus told you. That had nothing to do with you being able to eat whatever you want. That was about washing your hands before you eat. All right. Anyways, I digress. And there is a reason why we use KJV people. Okay. All right. And I'm going to say it again. It's a good thing, even though Trump was saying, you know, for Easter, it doesn't matter. We know Easter is pagan. Okay. But whatever is going to get King James Version Bibles back into people's homes is good. That's one way you know that that's of the Lord, because he wasn't saying, let's get NIV Bibles into the home. Okay. He said, get the KJV. Anybody who's a diehard Christian, in the Western world, we know about this KJV, bro. Right? That's how I know. I don't. I don't trust the nigga who used the NIV. I don't. I don't. What use the NIV? What? Get out of here. <laughs> Straight up. You don't use the K. If you don't use the KJV, I look at you weird. Like, oh, I, I use this other. I use the NIV, the New Living. I use this. You a weirdo to me. All right. Let's pick it back up here. We old school, old fashioned, traditional. We going back to the old way of doing things. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible told you to do too? The old way of doing things is good. Okay. It says later generations should look. This is in the Bible. Later generations should look back to the old and see what their forefathers did to learn from that. But anyways, I digress. Acts chapter 11. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Acts chapter 11. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. That's why I love Mississippi and we're going to end me and we got our plans and stuff because Mississippi doesn't change. Mississippi doesn't have diversity. Mississippi only has black and white people. You feel me? If I was white, I'd move to Utah. You know, for when crap hits the fan, I, if I was white, I'd go to Utah, but I'm not white and my family's from Mississippi. So I'm going to go to Mississippi, right? And right now, before crap hits the fan, if I was white, I'd go to Mont. I'm not joking. I'm serious. I'd go to Montana, Idaho, Eastern Washington. That's where I would go choose to live. Or Wyoming. Why? Because all those places are like over 90% white. It's rural. Most of the people are Christian. It's not urban. And it doesn't have a whole bunch of diversity. Because diversity is not 
not biblical. Facts. That's a lesson for another day. But anyways, I like Mississippi because there's no diversity. Mississippi doesn't change and it's stuck in its old ways. Anyways, Acts chapter 11, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Skip down now to verse 7. Verse 7. And I heard a voice. Actually, let's, uh, let's pick it up at verse 5. I was in the, or actually verse 4. Peter said, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning. This is verse 4. And expounded it by order unto them, saying, verse 5. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheep, let down from heaven by four corners. And it came even to me, upon the which when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Note, if, you would have, if we would have read all of Leviticus chapter 11, that's what it dealt with, beasts, fowls of the air and creeping things. So that's why he's saying this. The Jews would understand, oh, you saw that you saw the things from Leviticus 11, right? Verse seven. And I heard a voice saying unto me, arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my, entered into my mouth. Verse nine. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God hath cleansed, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to keep reading down. Let's fix this. Because I want, we're going to read down to verse. We're going to read down to verse 18. All right, verse, let's pick it back up here at verse nine. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come onto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then have God also, then have God also to the Gentiles granted repentance of life. Right? Now, Let's read, let's go back into Acts chapter 10 really quick. Because I want y'all to get the full, the full uh, thing. Let's go to Acts. Let's go back into Acts chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 23 through 28. Acts chapter 10, verses 23 through 28. All right, it says here, then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew 
to keep company or come on to one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Oh, so the vision, the vision that Peter had with all the animals had nothing to do with food, huh? Let's go now to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. So it had to do with, that had to do with man being clean or unclean. All right, now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Now that you have the proper understanding, biblically, and from the lesson we did on the Sabbath about the dietary law, you should understand what P what Paul is saying here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. So Paul says here that there's going to be members of the church, and this is talking about during New Testament times, there will be members of the church who are going to break off because they had heard that because they're going to start teaching false doctrines. And where did these people get these false doctrines from? Demons, right? And what are some of these false doctrines? Verse two, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. If your conscience is seared with a hot iron, that means you have no conscience. All right? Verse three, forbidding to marry, right? So, who, what Christian group forbids people from marrying? The Catholic Church forbids its priests from marrying, okay? And this is what Paul was warning about, the rise of the Catholics, because Paul had already seen it happening in Rome, at the church in Rome. That's why in his epistle to the Romans, he explicitly warns the Gentiles not to take over the church from the Jews. In the book of Romans, he warns the Romans and the Italians, do not take over the church from the Jews. But what did the Romans and the Italians do? That exact thing. And they set up the Catholic church. All right. Now, it also says here in verse three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. This didn't say commanding to, uh, this didn't say anything about the dietary law. This said abstaining from all meat. This is why in the New Testament, Paul deals, in Paul's epistles, it seems weird to people, but Paul actually deals with vegetarians because that was an issue that came up in the church. We're not going to deal with it now, but it was an issue that came, it was an issue that came up in the church. Okay. Now, so Paul here, when he's saying they're commanding to abstain from meats, right? That's talking about all meats. Okay. Remember, originally the Catholics, like during Lent, you know, no meat, okay? Which Lent's not even in the Bible. And then remember on Fridays, and I'm not a Catholic, I'm a, I'm a regular American. My family's from the South and they're not from New Orleans. I don't do that Catholic stuff. That's why I don't do Joe Biden. I know, nah. America, we don't do Catholic. But anyways, that's that South of the border stuff. You want more problems? Keep letting the Catholic stuff come up in here. I don't do Catholic, so I don't know all this stuff like that. One of y'all who used to be Catholic or whatever, you know, you might be able to chime in on this. I think Wednesday was another day that they didn't eat meat, but I don't know. So anyway, I think that, that might be, I don't remember, it was like two days in the week, but Friday for sure, they used to not eat any meat. Then the Pope decided, and then another Pope in later generations was like, well, you can eat meat, but it can only be fish. No red meat. This is why you have fish fries on Friday. Even you niggas in the South who do the fish fry on Friday, you niggas do that because of Catholic stuff and you're not even Catholic. Think about that. Anyways, I, di I digress, but I don't digress. Let's pick it back up here. And the word nigga is in the Bible. It's an act, so don't get offended. And it's a Hebrew word. It's in your Old Testament lots of times. You just don't know that because you don't read Hebrew. All right. Where were we at here? Back here in verse three, forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. So nowhere in the Bible did uh, post the flood, did the Lord say you can't eat meat, okay? Post the flood, you can eat, you can eat meat if you want to. You don't have to eat meat, 
If you don't want to, you can be a vegetarian. But if you want to eat meat, you can. And if you're going to eat meat, you know what meats you, you can and cannot eat? You can eat the meats that God created for you to eat, right? Which we read in Leviticus 11, some beasts and animals are clean and good for you to eat and others are unclean and you shouldn't eat them. And if you do eat them, you've transgressed the law, which is sin, 1 John 3 and 4, okay? All right, middle of verse, middle of verse three. Let's pick it back up here, middle of verse three. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Those of us who believe and know the truth, we know what meats we can and cannot eat. It tells us that in the Bible. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. Now, Sunday, this is another example of cherry picking scriptures. Sunday Christians love to go here, false Christians. They'll go here and see, I can eat whatever I want. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. And they stop there and they don't read the rest of the passage. Okay? And they don't read before, like we just did, verses one through three to get context. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be and nothing to be refused if it be received. Now, notice here, if is a clause. That's a clause. So this wasn't an indefinite commandment, meaning indefinite, meaning, oh, I can eat whatever I want. No, the if clause means there's a requirement, meaning there are certain things you can and cannot eat. That's why Paul put if here. This is why you're not supposed to cherry pick scriptures. OK, now that if there is a very, very important clause. It says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If, if, if it be received with thanksgiving, one, for it is sanctified. Remember I told you earlier when we were in Leviticus 11, remember how it said that all those clean animals were sanctified, set apart for you to eat. And if you keep the dietary law, you'll be sanctified and holy. We read that in Leviticus 11, remember? Okay. All right. It says here, and we're going to read it again. All right. Verse five, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay. So what meats can you eat? He tells you here with that clause, if these are the ones you can eat, the ones that have been sanctified by the word of God. How do I know what meat has been sanctified, meaning set apart by the word of God, meaning the Bible? Well, I go into the Bible and read and find out. And in Leviticus chapter 11 and in Deuteronomy chapter 14, it tells you what meats were sanctified and set apart for you to eat and which meats were not. Then he says here, and is sanctified by prayer. We know that anyone who turns his ear from the law, anyone who turns his ear from hearing and doing the law, their prayer is an abomination. Tells you that in Proverbs. All right, verse six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter five. And remember, if Peter and Paul submitted himself onto Peter, and Peter already told you he don't eat anything unclean, so no, under no circumstance will Paul be telling Timothy here he can eat whatever he wants. Excuse me. Because Peter never gave Paul the cosign for that. So no. All right. Let's go to Galatians chapter. Let's go to Galatians chapter five. And we're going to pick it up at verse... 19. Galatians 5 and verse 19. Galatians 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So we all know that the works of the flesh, that's sin. We're supposed to be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. We're supposed to walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. Remember, Paul tells you in Romans 7 and 14 how you walk after the spirit, 
he tells you in Romans 7 and 14, the law is spiritual. So if you want to walk after the spirit, then you'll keep the law. Now he's going to tell you what it means to walk after the flesh, which is bad. You don't want to walk after the flesh. Okay? And he's going to include in here the dietary law. If you don't keep the dietary law, you're walking after the flesh. You want to know how, why you're walking after the flesh? Because you're doing what your flesh wants to do instead of what God wants you to do. Your flesh wants to eat that pork. Your flesh wants to eat that catfish. But the Bible told you you can't eat that. I digress. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like. And when it says drunkenness here, there, it's not just like with gambling, drinking alcohol is not a sin in and of itself because there's passages in the Bible that tells you to drink wine. There's, passable, there's passages in the Bible that tells you on the feast days, if you want to enjoy strong drink, which is alcohol, that's fine. Alcohol becomes a sin when you get wasted, right? If you're a drunkard, when you lose control, everything in moderation. So if you get wasted and you're a drunkard, when you're in that state of being drunken, we're not talking a little tipsy or you got a nice little, you know, you're a nice little buzz, right? And even with alcohol, I used to drink a lot of alcohol from once I became an adult, kind of runs in the family, tear that whiskey up, tear that Hennessy up. Um, for the last couple of years, last few years, I don't really drink alcohol, right? But I'm just sharing that with me. I'm sharing that too, because for some people, you might need to stop too for health reasons. Some people can't drink hard in the paint all the way up until they 60s and 70s. It might tear up your liver and stuff. So the word to the wise is usually sufficient. Um, you know, I cut that out before it got to, before it became a health problem, right? But when drinking becomes a sin is when you get wasted. And when you're wasted, you don't remember what you did. And so because you didn't remember, what, because you don't fully remember what you did the night before or earlier in the day, you don't have a clear conscience. You could have ate something defiled. You could have did a sin. You don't know. You was wasted. All right. Anyways, I digress. Jesus drunk liquor and wine all the time, but he didn't get wasted. We can read that in the Bible. All right. I digress. All right. It says here in the middle of verse 21, revelings and such like right now in verse 19 paul mentions on cleanliness as well the dietary law is a part of the cleanliness laws if you violate the dietary law you are now unclean what does it say here about people who violate the cleanliness laws and who do unclean things middle of verse 21 as I have told you in the as I have told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's go to Ephesians 5. So if you eat unclean things on purpose, meaning violating a dietary law, Paul just said here you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5 and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Ephesians 5 and 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You know, little children just obey their parents. When they're little kids, you believe whatever your parents or adults tell you. Walk in love as Christ also have loved us. How do you walk in love? By keeping the commandments. Tells you that in the Gospel of John. Tells you that in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. You walk in love by keeping the commandments. All right? So if I'm going to walk in love, I'm not going to eat pork because that's one of the commandments. As Christ also have loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So notice here, Christ was given for an offering and a sacrifice. That's why we don't sacrifice lambs and goats anymore and pigeons and pour out wine and grain offerings. Christ fulfilled that. That's the only thing that was nailed to the cross, okay? You know how people think, and that's only, 
and we're going to read if we get to it this morning. We're going to read where the Lord even tells you, like the word the Lord tells you, he just put that on pause. The sacrificial law, it'll pick back up again after the end of the tribulation, during Christ's thousand year reign, after his, after his second advent, after his second coming. But Christ dying on the cross, the only law that was nailed to the cross, the sacrificial law, meaning the sacrificing of animals to make atonement, which really couldn't make atonement for you anyway. Paul is letting you know here, Christ was the sacrifice and the offering. All right, let's pick it up here at verse 33. But fornication and all uncleanliness. Notice here, Paul didn't say some uncleanliness. Paul said all uncleanliness. Okay? The dietary law is one of those things that falls in the cleanliness laws. If you violate it, you're unclean. Paul didn't say some uncleanliness. Paul said all uncleanliness, right? But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. So your auntie, she kojic. And don't kojic people think they holy rollers and they the saints? Well, if your auntie is kojic and she eat pork, she not a saint. You did. All right, let's pick it back up here at verse three. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater, the key, the, the key here is unclean person, because you're a kojic auntie who thinks she's a saint, but she's not that eats pork is unclean. Your mama and daddy who eat pork are unclean. What's going to happen to the unclean person? Oh, I never finished saying, I don't remember if I finished saying what my earlier, because we went off on a tangent, what my dad did the last time we was there. Because I started talking to y'all about separate, like some of you need to, you know, free yourselves from extended family and just focus on you individually. If you don't have a, if you're not married yet and have kids, and if you are married and have kids, you need to focus on your own household. But um, last time I was there, they got barbecue from this place called Johnny Rebs. And it was, a, I think it was like 4th of July or something. I don't remember what it was. It was some gathering because I had some of my other siblings there. And my dad told, my wife told Amber, like he didn't get no food. He didn't really get no food for us because we were asking where, you know, they went to a barbecue place. So it's a lot of pork. And we were like, so did you get any beef or chicken? And my dad was like, ah, sucks to be you. Anyways, I digress. So these are all little, and anyway, so I digress. I do, I don't, no cohabitation with darkness. So I don't care if it's family or not. I'm doing my, I'm doing my own thing. And I have less problems with my family here in Mississippi. So that's why I live over here. They tend to be, even though most of them are Sunday Christians, they don't tend to kick against what I'm saying. And they're more receptive and nice. And if I go over there, they'll make sure I have, you know, something I can eat too. So anyways, I, I digress. Let's pick it back up here. Where were we at? All right, end of, ver end of verse five. All right. And y'all know that's messed up because some of you have, you know, good parents. And and when I'm saying good parents, I only put my dad in this category. Like I said, I don't I don't have any beef with my mom. But some of y'all have good parents, and when you go over there to eat, they know you keep the dietary law. They made something for you, right? That's clean, and they got something for the other kids, right? That's what a good parent. That's what a good parent would do. Okay. Anyways, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse five. For this, ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor a covetous man who is an idolater have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. All right, so Paul said here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7, God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 11. Go back to Leviticus 11. 
And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Leviticus 11. We're going to go back to Leviticus 11 and pick it up at verse 1. All right, Leviticus 11. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Skip down now to verse 44. Verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. First Thessalonians 4 and 7, this New Testament. For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Let's go back to Leviticus 11 and verse 44. Let it sink in. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt, Africa, to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. First Thessalonians 4 and 7, let it think in, sink in. For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. All right, back here in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 46. This is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the what? The unclean and the clean and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So here in verse 47, it said to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7 again. For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. So nah, you still can't eat that pork. Sorry, bro. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Now we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Now we're going to look at, should you be doing Christmas? Will a real Christian celebrate Christmas? Or would a real Christian not celebrate Christmas? We go to Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So you know how people put, first of all, the Bible says you're not supposed to do Christmas trees. Christmas trees are a sin. And you know how dummies get Christmas trees and then dummies put the Christmas trees in their house? I used to be a dummy too. Not when it comes to this. I always hated Christmas. Christmas was BS to me once I got like 11 years old. I'm not getting a bunch of toys anymore. This is stupid. All right. And once I started getting clothes, this was before I even came into truth. Once I started only getting clothes, I was like, this is stupid. And then, you know, when you get older, you get older and you start only getting one gift. <laughs> I was like, this is dumb. Anyways, but I have other stuff in my life where, you know, I was dumb, dumb. Everybody plays dumb, dumb at some point. But dummy brings the Christmas tree into their house and then dummy puts a star on top of the Christmas tree because the star is supposed to represent this year. This wasn't a star, dummy. It was an angel. It pays to read your Bible. All right, let's pick it back up here. Facts. Read your Bible for yourself. Read your Bible for yourself every day. Read your Bible for yourself every day. Okay? That way you know you're not being lied to because you read the Bible for yourself. All right? Now, let's pick it back up here at verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. Another one, it said, wise men from the east. It didn't say three. So I don't know why your name, your manger scene got three wise men, one black, one Chinese, and one white. I don't know why you did that. And I don't know why you got a star on top of, on top of your tree and on top of your manger scene. Uh, beats me. All right. And did the wise men even arrive while he was still in the manger? Mm -hmm. Anyways, people be stuck on stupid. Let's pick it back up here at verse three. People like doing stupid stuff. Low, low IQ individuals. 
Verse three, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the provinces of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Herod is an Edomite. Notice Herod didn't know where G and, and the Edomites had already been converted by the Maccabees. But Herod didn't know where Jesus was going to be born. Where did Herod have to go to find out? He had to go to the real Jews. Herod is a fake Jew. He's an Edomite Jew. Fake Jew. The Edomite fake Jew had to go to the real Jews to find out what time it is. All right, let's pick it back up there at verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Let's skip down now to verse 11. Now remember, remember this, what they saw the angel when he was born. So they're coming after the fact. So you realize like the gifts that, that they brought, they weren't even brought on his birthday. And Jesus's birthday is not December 25th. And nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to even celebrate his birthday. <clears throat> We're giving gifts because they brought gifts to Jesus on his birthday. They didn't bring these gifts on his birthday. Y'all don't read, man. Anyway, let's pick it back up here at verse. Let's pick it back up here at verse eleven. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented on them gifts. I almost this is the the, the spirit speaking. This is for brother Daryl. Be when little Daryl gets older, and it'll probably be the same with the other one, with the other kids as well, but. When little Daryl gets older, be prepared that if you've done everything right, be prepared that he's probably going to know more than you in the scriptures and be better because you've been training him up right from birth. So don't resist that. Like when he gets older and if he, he start coming to, he start explaining stuff to you, don't resist that and be like, how can you explain stuff to me? I'm the one who taught you stuff. I used to clean your diaper and all that stuff. No, he was brought up in that. And the reason why I'm using him as an example, I'm going to switch it over to myself. I wasn't brought up in the full truth, but my parents brought me up in church and they conditioned me to read the Bible for myself. Okay, And that's an advantage I had over them because my mom, my mom didn't read the Bible her whole life since childhood. They went to church, but they didn't read the Bible like that. And my dad did not grow up going to church because my grand, his parents, my grandma, my grandma and grandpa, they didn't go to church on a regular basis. I've told this story, but, you know, still wanting to make sure their kids knew stuff. My grandma and grandpa made my dad as a child on some Sundays, you know, a couple times a month. He had to go to church by himself, <laughs> but they didn't go. And I've told this story before. My dad would choose to go to the Catholic church. He don't know nothing about Catholic stuff at all, right? And he wasn't paying attention. He just chose to go to the Catholic church because he was like, excuse me. He decided to go to the Catholic church because their services were only 30 minutes to an hour. And if he went to the black churches in the neighborhood, their services went on and on and on. And he wanted to get in and get out because my... Uh, Grandma and grandpa weren't going anyway, and they were just making him go. So my parents instilled in me, make sure you read the Bible from birth. And now I'm an adult, and when I try to deal with them and stuff in the Bible, they don't want to hear me. Even though righteously and truthfully and technically, I'm more learned in the scriptures than them now. Okay? All right, I digress. Let's pick it back up here. And another thing, too. You should always want your children to be better than you. You're not fighting. It's a competition and you want your children to win. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's a competition and you want your children to win. Each successive generation should be better. All right, Matthew chapter two, picking it back up here at verse 11. 
And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Oh, they're not in the manger? No, the three wise men came to Mary and Joseph's house. Oh, so why you have that nat nativity scene in your front yard? My parents do that. Why, why they do that? That don't make no sense. That's stupid. That's not even scripturally accurate. Anyways, I, I don't like wasting my time and I don't like doing stupid stuff. <laughs> but uh, apparently a lot of people do. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. Oh, he's a young child now. He's not a baby. No, because this ain't Jesus' birthday. They didn't come to him on his birthday. They came after he was a young child and then gave him gifts. So this concept of on Christmas, we're giving gifts because on Jesus' birthday, when he was born, he got gifts. That's false. That's not when the wise men showed up. Also, December 25th is not the son, S-O-N, of God's birthday. December 25th is the S-U-N's birthday in paganism and in idolatry. That's Mithras' birthday, Sol and Viticus' birthday, right? The sun god. But anyways, I digress. Verse, uh, middle of verse 11. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and fragrances and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. All right, let's skip down now to verse, let's skip now now to verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So Jesus had to be like two years old. All right. Also, we're not reading this passage here, but it lets you know what the shepherds were doing at the time Jesus was born. And the shepherds were keeping the sheep still outside where they would sleep outside where the sheep were. The shepherds didn't sleep outside with the sheep in the winter. Right. So Jesus wasn't born December 25th. Also, the Bible tells you when Jesus was born as far as what month, not the exact date, but around what month. And there's only one of two options. He was either born in the fall, sometime around Sakat or Feast of Tabernacles, or he was born in the spring, sometime around Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. If the evidence leans more heavily towards fall and, the, and Sakat. How do we know this? Because we know when John the Baptist was born and you can correlate when Jesus was born based off of when John the Baptist was born and based off of when Elizabeth conceived John the Baptist and based off of when Mary conceived. It tells you all this information and we can fit this. That's a lesson for another day. We normally do it when we do the lesson on why Christmas is pagan. But we know when Elizabeth was, uh, we know when Elizabeth conceived of John the Baptist with, you know, she conceived from her husband, Zacharias, and John the Baptist was conceived in her womb. We know when that happened because it happened immediately after Zacharias did his course in the temple. And Zacharias' course was after the course of Abijah. And that's only, that's two times a year at a certain time. So we know when Jesus was born and it was not December 25th, nor was it in winter. It's impossible for Jesus biblically to have been born in winter. So you're just doing a lie. All right. Christians should not observe Christmas. Also remember Jesus is the king of the Jews. He was not born on December 25th. Also remember Jesus is eternal and does not have a birthday. Right. Remember before he came into the world in a flesh and blood body, he, all, he already existed. Okay. So Jesus is eternal. Also notice here, Herod the Edomite had to go to the Israelites for knowledge, just like Cornelius the Italian. All right, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Jeremiah 10 and verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord. Learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. The signs of heaven is talking about the stars, the sun and the moon. 
And when the Gentiles get dismayed at the signs is in the winter time. You know, you even see, why do we have daylight savings time? And stuff? these Gentiles go bonkers over darkness. <laughs> like when it's getting dark, oh no, it's scary. Right, anyways, so because the Gentiles live in crazy places, I mean, I'm saying the Gentiles, I'm talking about white people, Europeans. Because Europeans live in the smallest, I'm going to go in, so buckle your seatbelts. And you got to ask yourself, let all of humanity ask themselves this. Whether you're Asian, African, whatever, ask yourself this. Why do white people live in the European uh, peninsula? Europe is one peninsula. It's not even a continent. Y'all live in one little small section of the world. That should tell you something. Why did you end up going there when everyone else is every all over the planet? You originally decided to go live in frozen mountains and in frozen areas, right? That's a sign that other people didn't want to deal with you and you had to go away. This is just facts if you want to be technical. All right, next. They live in up there in Europe, the further north you go, they have, like in the summer and winter, they go days with no light. Days. Days with no light. Days with no darkness, depending on what the se- depending on what the season is. This kind of stuff has been proven to cause psychological issues, mental health issues, and whatnot, right? And so they get dismayed by the signs of heaven when winter comes. So this is why white people have the custom of dragging in a tree into their house, which is stupid. Why are you bringing a tree that is meant to be outside inside of your house? Well, the reason the white people did that was because it's an evergreen tree and they got spooked in wintertime when everything around them is dying because winter is a time of death, right? We had a couple of family members die this during this winter. Y'all know what time it is. Winter is a death time, right? But when they're looking around them, all the leaves are off the trees now. Nothing. The trees look like they're dead. So they bring the evergreen tree into their house, okay? So remind them, oh, this is just temporary, right? Eventually, we'll go back to having green trees and all that stuff. So they drag in the Christmas tree. And this was something that they were doing before they before the Catholics tried to put Jesus on top of this, erroneously, right? Let's pick it back up here. Let's pick it back up here at verse... Uh, three on a good side though going with the Europeans this is why is you need it behooves you is wise to know these things about people because the Lord created all nations of people are like breeds of dogs and the Lord wanted all these nations and these breeds and he didn't want us mixed mingling facts but anyways we're all like different breeds of dogs and different breeds have different characteristics and traits good traits and bad traits okay so for Europeans, the, the sons and daughters of Japheth that actually live in Europe, not the ones like in India and places, but in Europe, in Western Europe, one of the good things that y'all got from this and as a part of your breed is you guys are hardworking and you will come up with technology and inventions and all that type of stuff because of where you have to live. It's not conducive for humans to live there. That's why the majority of humans don't live there. And that's why starting in the 14, starting in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, the majority of Europe's population left and went where? Brazil, Argentina, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. This is learning on your learning on your way to learning. But because of the type of breed that they are, okay, and I'm saying that because some people don't like the fact that you know a lot of white men are like this. This is an actual good thing. Okay. That's why they're so that's why they're so good at, you know, the, the work ethic, developing things, especially Germans. Okay. But Germanic peoples live the furthest up north in Europe. Side note, learning on your way to learning. Let's pick it back up here at verse three. And nobody should take offense because I go hard on my own people all the time. I normally bash my own people more than I bash anybody else. All right, verse three. It says here, for the customs of the people are vain. Vain means pointless, worthless. For one cut of a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. We got the Christmas tree here. They deck it, deck the halls with 
whatever. I don't remember them stupid songs. But you know them Christmas songs, right? Didn't they say deck the halls with whatever? Here, deck the tree with what? Silver and gold. You can't afford silver and gold, Joe Biden's economy, right? So you go get silver and garland from uh, Hobby Lobby and you put that on your Christmas tree, right? It says here, and the Bible just said, all of that is vain and pointless. But I'm celebrating Jesus. It's baby Jesus' birthday. No, it's not. And what you trying to celebrate in Jesus' name, the Bible just said here is vain, pointless. Pointless means there's no point for you to do it. All right, let's pick it back up here. Verse three, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cut off a tree out of the forest. The, oh, I'll flip it. Part of the reason niggas is lazy because you in Africa and in, in, in the tropics and you could just sit around, things grow naturally, picking fruits and stuff from trees, all kind of meat around you. So niggas develop the habit of being a little lazy. Okay? This is the truth. I don't care if you don't want to hear it or not. This has nothing to do with us building kingdoms. Yeah, we built a lot of kingdoms and we have civilization, but we tend to be a little bit more lazy. These are facts. I'm going to give you a fact. Mississippi is the home of the slave. If you want to know about slavery, go to Mississippi in the United States. My cousin, I've told this story before. I asked my cousin because, you know, my family that didn't leave in the Great Migration stayed here. I, I like them better. They tend to be doing better. And I like my family that did leave in the Great Migration. I like my, uh, I like my uncle, the one uncle who left because he still come back out here. He got a house out here and all that. I'm trying to emulate them. I'm trying to emulate my uncles, my mom's brothers. That's who I'm trying to emulate. But anyways, one of my uncles, sons, right? My cousin, I'm down in Pike County, Southwest Mississippi, chilling with the family. And it's the summertime and it's super hot. Like y'all know it's super hot in the South. And I asked my cousin, I'm like, man, because I heard stories about, you know, for extra money, my mom and her siblings, so my uncles, my cousin's dad, for extra money, sometimes in the summer, they would go pick stuff, like, you know, to make extra money. They would go pick, and that way they could buy. Because think about, I'm talking about when they were kids. You know how now you have your kids in front of tablets and iPads, and, you all, and all they do is play video games, and everything is a joke to them? Well, 70 years ago, kids used to work. You feel me? For real, they used to work. It's a shame now you got 10, 11, 12-year-olds, 9-year-olds, all they know is screams. They don't know how to work. That's not abuse to a child. You're doing your child a disservice if you don't teach them how to work from a young age. And you're doing them a disservice if you don't teach them how to do adult, like teach them how to do adult work from a young age. That's how they're going to learn. Oh, your daughter is six, seven, eight years old. Bring her butt in the kitchen. Teach her how to cook. Okay? A seven-year-old girl, eight-year-old girl, nine-year-old girl, she can cook. I've seen it done before in the South. It can be done. Okay? Have your, kid, have your kids out there with you learning the trade, learning these skills. But anyways, I, like I said, I digress. So they used to have to go and work because if they wanted school clothes, my grandma was like, you're going to have to pay for that yourself. <laughs> like, we don't, you know, hey, it's hard times. I don't got that. Your, you know, your daddy just died. My grandma's husband died. You know, if y'all want that, go. Whatever the stuff you want, you want new clothes, all that stuff, go work. Okay? So that's what they did in the summer. I asked my cousin, I'm like, how did my mom and your dad work in this hot sun? And, my, and he said it as a joke. But he was serious. He said, the whip, cuz. That's what he's like, the whip, cuz. The whip will make a nigga do a lot of things. That's literally what he said. And he wasn't joke. He wasn't really joking. <laughs> My cousin doesn't joke like that. That was a straight up Mississippi saying that we all know. How did you get them niggas to work? The whip. All right. Anyways, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse three. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cut up a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. You know how you put that little bowl under the tree with the water and you fasten it down with the wood planks, right? Bible's telling you you're not supposed to do that. No Christmas trees. 
They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must not needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them. When it says here, be not afraid of them, that means don't pay any respect to them, right? Don't, res don't give any honor to Christmas tree, meaning don't do that. They cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Let's skip down now to verse eight. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock, the stock here is talking about the tree. The word stock means tree. This word here in the Hebrew is talking about the tree. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. So the Bible just told you here, the Christmas tree and Christmas is a doctrine of vanities. All right, now we're already at two hours. We might not hit the, um, we have time to hit these Good Friday ones. We got a few. <laughs> Maybe we do another one. All right. I'm, uh, we're going to stop here for this morning's Bible study because we've already been going two hours. Um, I got a couple other subjects I was going to hit on as well for who is the real Christian part two. Maybe, Lord willing, if we can do a part three before tomorrow's uh, Shabbat Eve Bible study, then we will. Um, if not, if we're not able to, then this will just be the end of this um, lesson series. But I had a couple other um, points I was going to hit on as far as who is the real Christian, right? So we were going to talk about Easter and how Easter and Good Friday is not really biblical. But we're going to deal with that this weekend in a two-part series lesson anyway in more depth. But this would have been a good like segue in. And then we were also going to deal with uh, how people who think they're people who think they're Christians wrongly. They think when they die, they're going to float up to heaven. And that's not scriptural either. We were going to touch on those. But um, if time permits, then if time permits, maybe later tonight we'll do one or in the morning. If we don't do one tonight or in the morning, then this will just be the last one. Amen. All right. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing and doing of his word. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen.